this week, we journey into the past to two of Waterford's old railways, the Waterford and Tremor Line and the Waterford, Dungarvan and Lismore Railway. The arrival of trains in Waterford, as elsewhere, transformed the lifestyle of the people. Travel became easier and people's horizons were broadened. Trade between towns increased, as did communication between the different parts of the county. People's leisure time improved as they could travel to Tremor or Dungarvan in the summertime and enjoy the pleasures of the seaside. People in Waterford still fondly remember these old railways and sadly mourn their loss. We asked Jack O'Neill, an ex-train driver and fireman who worked on both lines, to tell us firstly about the early history of the Waterford and Tremor Railway. Well, you're standing on what, what used to be the, um, the route of the, of the train and the line was privately owned from its beginning in 1853 until it was absorbed by government order into the Great Southern and Western Railway in 1925. All railways of Ireland, still to the border, were absorbed into that company at that time. The original plan for a railway from Tremor to Waterford in 1846 was that it would be a part of the Cork and Waterford Railway. However, when this failed to materialise due to financial problems, Local people set about building the Waterford Tremor section themselves and applied to the English Parliament for an act to allow for its construction. This act was passed on the 24th of July, 1851. The first order was cut on February the 10th, 1853, and the line was opened in September 1853, which was a very, very rapid piece of work. It was built by William Jargon, the railway builder, and the total cost of the line and the equipment, which included three locomotives and 21 coaches, was 77,350 pounds. A very, very small sum for the seven and a half miles of line. Now a feature about it is the line was not physically connected in any shape or form with any of the other railways in Ireland. So it was completely self-contained. And as a private company, for its, for its over 60 years in private ownership, only four locomotives were bought by the company, which was a very, very small number. Up to 1935, um, the railway ran the oldest working locomotive in these items, which was uh, number 483 in the Great Southern and Western Railway Registration. It was number one in the Great in the uh, Walton Tramore Registration. Uh, the line started in Manor Street. It was uh, uh, right in the centre of the city. The station was a beautiful building of um, Flemish architecture, which unfortunately was demolished in, in these periods when everybody wanted to build in concrete. And it was replaced by a monstrosity. Which, which now has disappeared also. But the, uh, the line started Manor Street, ran through fairly fertile country as far as um, uh, roughly where the Ring Road is now on the, on, on the, the Tramore Road. And then it went into Bogland. And it was through a bog, a natural causeway, through the bog, as far as the Black Rock. When it again went into reasonably fertile farmland, through some forestry uh, at, at um, just before he came to Pickerstown, crossed the road at Pickerstown on the only major bridge on the road, and uh, eventually arrived at Tramore Station. As it was, the running time to Tramore was a quarter of an hour each way, 15 minutes. Uh, the railway built up a lot of goodwill with uh, people of a lot of goodwill. Funny enough, the, uh, the, uh, the old railway company allowed, they were Quakers, the old railway, the old railway owners, and fairly Quaker owned, but there was a regulation in that railway that uh, friars, Franciscan priests, Dominican Christian brothers were not to be charged for traveling on the line. Other acts of goodwill included the company offering to carry building materials free of charge to Tremor and a free pass for five years to anyone building or purchasing a house there. They also offered special inclusive tickets such as one week's accommodation at the Grand Hotel plus the return journey at the price of only two guineas. Such goodwill and perks encouraged people to live in and travel to Tremor. Another gesture was the train laid on for the poor children's outing. It was a remarkable thing. That was organised by um, the Trades Council in Waterford. The last one was under the uh, morality of John S. Glosper, who was a, a school teacher in Mount Sain in the uh, secondary schools. He was, he, he was the mayor presided over the last year with him, but it was, it was very funny because the kids, maybe two, three thousand of them, would be assembled in the uh, courthouse grounds. 
And every child was given a piece of cardboard with the safety pin, which he, his name and address was pinned onto his jumper, whatever he was wearing. The Berwick Street Brass and Reed Band came down. The mayor and corporation, the Robes of Office, they formed up behind the band. The band struck up a marching tune. All these kids, poverty unbelievable. They marched behind the mayor and corporation down to Manor Street Station where a special train was laid onto them. The mayor and corporation got into the uh, coach behind the engine. The kids would be there only out for a whole year. They came out from Ward and spent the whole day out there. They were given sandwiches and rock buns and lemonade, you name it. I always felt uh, uh, deprived because I was never on the yard. My father was working, so I couldn't go on it. And I felt a deprived child because of that. Quite a number of others felt deprived too. Jack, can you tell us about the crashes that occurred on the Tremor line? There were three. And ironically, all three occurred in August. The first one was in 1858 when the locomotive going onto the turntable at Manor Street failed to stop. Now, at that time, the uh, only type of brake in use was a handbrake. And apparently the handbrake had, had slacked out. The, the pins holding it had broken. So the engine went through the wall and killed a man in railway, railway square, not railway square proper, uh, Mendicity Lane. He was killed there. His name was Kenny, Patrick Kenny. The next one again occurred in August, and that seemed to have been sabotage. That was in, uh, when the uh, oldest locomotive, in working locomotive in these islands, was derailed at Carrick Long Bridge. The number of the engine was number 483, and she never worked afterwards. She was cut up on the spot, which was a pity, because it was only 15 years to go for the centenary. Uh, the last one occurred again in August, on the 14th of August, to be accurate, 1947, when the 1215 train, or sorry, 1115 from Waterford that night, failed to stop in Tramor and went through the wall. The engine resting on the Strand Road with the buffers touching the, the Deluxe Hotel. And that formed an extra tourist attraction in Tramor for the 15th, because they came from all around the country to see this engine stranded in majestic splendor there at the top of the Strand Road. Uh, it was re-railed on the night of the 15th, 16th of August, and worked, the engine worked um, until the, they were replaced by rail cars in 1954. Total staff uh, would, would have, total staff would have, would have been between Tramore and Waterford, and inclusive of those who maintained the, the line, the permanent way as it's called, 22 total staff to cater for something in the region of maybe a quarter of a million people in the year. There was one extraordinary man on it. Again, he, was, he used to do relief. He relieved the, the regular drivers who would be on holidays. Uh, his name was Joe O'Neill, no relation whatsoever. He lived in Sally Park. He could never resist a challenge. If he spotted a car on the road, he had to race it. So on one occasion, he, he was boasting about his ability, you know, how fast he could go to Tramore, and the idiots on the line couldn't go any, couldn't go any faster than he could. To the maximum speed allowed on it was 45 miles an hour. So on this day he made a bet with uh, one of the passengers <coughs> that he would do Tramore in 10 minutes. And the bet was for a pound, a lot of money that time. He lost the bet because it took him 11 minutes to go to Tramore. But he was annoyed about this, so the following day he went out in 10 minutes. And the permanent way, the man in charge of the permanent way, the rails, a man named Hunt, was horrified when he, when he found out the speed this man had been trying to do on, on, his, on his beloved line. So he promptly had him removed and he was never put there again. He was, he was a menace. <laughs> he, would, he would have been a menace. But uh, there was another individual then who was very nervous. And he was terrified that somebody would abuse the engines. Uh, that they would exceed the speed. And of course, when an engine was being abused, the steam engine, it ran, it threw sparks up in the air. He lived quite close to the line. And one of the relief men sent across decided to play a trick on him one night. So he got a pile of wood wool. I don't know if you know what wood wool is. It's used to pack cups and what have you, cutlery. <coughs> Excuse me. So he piled this into the firebox of the engine as he passed his house. And of course, there was a shower of sparks. It was half eleven at night, and this man was on duty at five. The following morning, he got up on his bicycle and he cycled in to make sure that the engine hadn't been damaged in any shape or form. There was a lot of tricks like that played. It was a, it, it was a very, um, a very amusing place for work.
mentioned the, the closure. When, when did the train stop running? It was, a, it was a very, very um, traumatic day on New Year's Eve, 19, 1960. They ran the last train out at 12.15 from Waterford. It was packed just two rail cars, that's all. They, they turned away a few hundred people. They ran out the two rail cars, and it was driven by a man named Dick Sweeney, who lived above in Tiger Avenue. Um, he didn't like the job he got that day, driving the last train to Tremor, and he thought he'd be bringing back the people that uh, he took out. Now, among those that travelled out was the mayor of the city at the time, and some member of the corporation. And they were brought out as guests at CIE. I think what they wanted to do was to show that uh, they had approval for the closure by the mayor and corporation travelling. I'm assuming that it could be wrong. But anyway, the, the people arrived in Tremor, and <clears throat> the mayor and members of the corporation were taken up to the a nearby hotel, wined and dined. The train then was sent back empty. Nobody, nobody was allowed to travel back on it. It was a very sad train coming in that, that, that day into Manor Street. His final journey, empty, nobody on it. Uh, the reason for that was that they wanted to introduce the buses as rapidly as possible. So later on that evening, uh, an inebriated mayor and members of the corporation went down to get on the bus and uh, the bus conductor who shall be nameless he's no dead anyway he came around to look like fares and the mayor said to him he said i'm the mayor of the city i don't care who you are he said you pay on this bus so they had been abandoned by the CIO officials and they had to pay their fare back on the bus they went out to the train for nothing but back on the bus a different ball game that's the that was the, uh, that was the, end, the of end of the line. Life. The, line was, the line was lifted the following day um, at double time plus time worked. CIE had the metal bridge at Pickerstown removed. That was over the roadway. That was the only major bridge on the line. By the removal of that bridge, the fate of the line was sealed. That's, that's portion of the original wall running along here with the, the, the black and white uh, indicators on top to indicate a corner. Presently, you use black and yellow or black and amber, to any colours. But at that time, they used black and white. And uh, that's all that's left of the, um, uh, the, the, the site of the bridge. You can probably see some of the, some of the original stones that, that were used in the construction of the bridge. You can see them here. <coughs> they carried, they carried the, the, the weight, of, weight of the train. And that's all that's left of Pickerstone Bridge today. Nothing, nothing else remains. Rather sad. The station at Manor Street was left lay there for about three years, derelict, um, out of use. Eventually it was demolished. And uh, <coughs> fortunately enough, the Tramor one was retained. Many people will have fond memories of summer trips to Tramor on the old railway. And everybody in Waterford must share a sense of loss in the passing away of this historic old line. Another of Waterford's old railways was the Waterford, Dungarvan and Lismore line. This company began life in 1872 to complete a direct railway between Cork and Waterford. It took six years to construct the 43 miles of track, which travelled through some breathtaking scenery and involved some extensive engineering projects. Jack O'Neill takes us along the route of the train. It began at Bilberry, where its terminus uh, was situated, right where the foundry is now. That was the railway station in Goodyard. It ran up then as far as um, Grays Dew Junction and went on to um, a narrow shelf of rock which, go which runs at the bottom of Mount Congreve Estate along the bank of the River Shore. It left the river at Kilmeden and started to go inland and climbed for nine miles up, up to an area that is called Newtown, and dropped then for a further two and a half miles into Kilmeg Thomas, a, a, a magnificent drop with the Cumbria Mountains in the background. The scenery in that line was unbelievable. From there then it began a series of climbs and drops between uh, Kilmeg Thomas and Duro, which was the next station. And there was a magnificent drop then from the tunnel at Duro, uh, from Valley Vile Viaduct, which is outside the tunnel, down into uh, Dungarvan. Three and a half mile of a drop into Dungarvan. Fantastic view with, of Dungarvan Bay on the left and the Cumbria Mountains on the right. The, the whole line was breathtaking. Uh, 
leaving Glengarvan, then it went through very, very fertile, soft fruit country and until it reached um, Kappa. From Kappa, then it went, went on to Kappa Quinn, uh, across the river Blackwater at Kappa Quinn by a, a very elaborate constructed viaduct, be beautiful piece of work, and eventually terminated in Lismore, where the Duke of Devonshire had built uh, a railway station which is still fortunately preserved, made of Portland stone, a magnificent building. The, the, line, the line actually went on to Mallow, but uh, the private line that we're dealing with now, which was built in 1872 and absorbed in 1898 uh, by the Great Southern and Western Railway, that was the line we're dealing with. The, uh, that had 43 crossing gates between Waterford and Lismore, an enormous number of crossing gates for 43 miles. And the total number of crossing gates between Waterford and Mallow, the entire length of the line, was 79 crossing gates for 78 miles, which, of course, contributed in no small way to the um, cost of the line. Uh, Jack, the line was an incredible uh, engineering achievement. In my opinion, yes. Uh, uh, the number of um, viaducts that had to be constructed, all of masonry and massive viaducts, one at Kinmac Thomas, one at Duro, and one at Ballyvile. The one at Ballyvile was blown up in 1923, January 1923, which closed the line for two years while the, until the viaduct was replaced. Uh, the amount of cutting that, had to, that they had to make through, through solid rock was unbelievable. And uh, the gradient, the grades on the line, uh, the gradient of the line was a very difficult achievement. It was very difficult terrain right through. Not, not easy terrain at all, and the only reason the line was built, principally the reason it was built, it was a, a rich agricultural area. And the railway at the time wanted to tap whatever revenue was available from the agriculture of the area. For example, you had salmon and sea trout from Lismore, from Lismore Castle. Kappa Quinn was famous for its, its, um, its cattle and its milk, milk products. Uh, John Garvin, of course, was a fantastic place in so far as the export of fish was concerned from John Garvin. Uh, potatoes, the early potatoes in the year, the earliest potatoes in Ireland, sorry, are in John Garvin, they're grown at Belnacorte. And all of those, a huge export market to England from that particular line. So that was the reason the line was built. Uh, it was difficult terrain, I admit, but uh, its revenue was pretty, was pretty good. And the causeway at Barnabuda, you have some oh, memories of that? John Garvin, yeah, there was uh, the Bernoulli. Uh, to translate, that means the gap of danger. And it was three quarters of a mile long. When you, when you left John Garvin station, you went, went through its suburb, for want of a better word, you actually went through the town itself. And you came out onto this causeway, which, which had a sea at both sides. Now, on a, on a bad winter's night, going across there on an open steam locomotive, it was quite an ordeal, because you had to battle the wind. Nine times out of ten, the waves would break over, over the engine, soaking both the driver and fireman. The passengers were comfortable enough inside in the coaches. But it was a, it was a rough, rough place to, to work over on a bad night. There was a number of crashes. Uh, there was a spectacular crash on the Shore Bridge uh, in July of 1945, when the 130 train from Cork, passenger train from Cork, which was hauled by a goods engine at the time. Um, an unsuitable engine for, for the curves on, on the, the John Garvin line. The curves were very sharp. And a goods engine doesn't carry small wheels in front which take curves um, at speed. They're, they're called bogey wheels and, they're, and they're, they operate on a, on a pivot. But there was no, there was no, there was no um, uh, bogey on this particular engine. She was a solidly six-coupled wheeled engine. It was a very warm summer, and coming down from Grey's Dew, the line had buckled with the heat of the sun, and the engine struck the buckle and left the rails. And in actual fact, stopped when it climbed the bridge. The, the marks of the wheels of the engine can still be seen on the bridge. The driver was trapped in the cab. His name was, was Jim Cleary. He lived in Ferrybank. And the fireman was a man named Harry Flynn. Now, Flynn managed to, to crawl through the small uh, observation window that fitted in the engine. How he did that, I, I, I never know. 
that uh, poor Cleary was trapped. The coal had fallen off the tender around these legs. Uh, the steam valves on the, on the top of the boiler had burst. And that was condensed inside in the cabin into boiling water, which was dripping down his back. He lost most of the skin off his back. So Murphy Engineering, there was no equipment uh, proper in the railway at the time, so Murphy Engineering came over with the acetylene burner. For the first time I ever saw an acetylene burner being used in, in, in Ireland. I don't think it was very, Murphy said it for very long at the time, but they cut the side of the cab out and cut the roof off the engine and released Cleary. And they were lucky not to have any casualties on that day? There were a few slightly injured, but the reason there were nobody seriously injured, with the exception of, the, of Cleary, the driver that I mentioned, uh, the reason nobody was seriously injured was that regulations had been broken that day when two horse boxes were, were picked up en route. And they should have been attached in rear of the train, but fortunately enough, to save time, they were attached behind the engine. And uh, these took the brunt of the collision when, when the engine uh, stopped on the bridge with her wheels up in the air. Uh, the coaches, of course, telescoped in but the two horse boxes disintegrated and all of the animals were seriously hurt. They had to be destroyed on the spot. Incidentally, they were, they were very expensive animals, but they did save the, uh, the life of the passengers on the train. Jack, there are a number of historical incidents uh, that happened on the line. Can you tell us about some? Well, there was, there was one, I suppose, the most, um, the most um, uh, best known one was the arrival of King Edward VII in Waterford on May the 2nd, 1904. He arrived at Bilberry Station, having spent the previous night with the Duke of Devonshire in Lismore Castle. <clears throat> and when he arrived, he was met by the mayor of the city, at that time named James Thor. Not, I hasten to add, the bully man, because he wasn't even alive then. Well, he was, he probably born. But uh, this James Thor was a, um, a leather merchant in Waterford City, lived in the manor, and he had laid on a banquet at his own expense in the Imperial Hotel that night for Edward the Seventh. So Edward decided that in view of uh, James's decency, he'd knight him. So he made him a knight on the platform of the R Bilberry Railway Station. The only instance I know of anyone being knighted in a railway station. Uh, Sir James was not very well, nobody knows very much about him now. He's simply faded into history. But uh, that was, uh, I suppose, the moment of glory of the station because it closed very shortly afterwards. That station later became uh, the storage place for the uh, building of Redmond Bridge. All the equipment to build the bridge was stored there and taken by barge down river. Later on then, during the First World War, it became an ammunition works owned by the, the Kynock Company. And it lay derelict then until 1935 when the Allied Irish foundry moved in. And of course, you know, it's still a foundry. Jack, when did the line close and what has happened to it subsequently? Uh, rather peculiarly, it closed in 1967 and demolition of the line began at Mallow, the Mallow Wind. And they, they lifted it very rapidly as far as Dungarvan and then stopped. And the reason they stopped was that the Quigley Magnesite Company had decided to set up in Dungarvan to process dolomite in Dungarvan and extract magnesium from the sea. So a new piece of railway was built a mile and a half long into the planted Balnacorti. An enormous weighted train started to run from the open cast mine at Venice Bridge daily down to Dungarvan. They took dolomite down and um, crude oil, which was, which was used to generate the heat. And the cargo out of Balnacorti was magnesite, which went to Cork for export to, to America. Now, that stopped in 1982. And the reason it stopped in 1982 was that the government of the day had put a massive duty on the oil. And it was no longer economical to, to get the uh, magnesite here in Dungarvan. So the factory closed down. Now the line has, has lain derelict since 1982, very much overgrown, but it's still intact from Waterford to Dungarvan. Not to Dungarvan itself, but Balnacorti. It's gone from Balnacorti to Dungarvan. Recently, there have been efforts made to reopen the remaining 28 miles of the Waterford, Dungarvan and Lismore line as a tourist attraction. It would certainly be nice to bring this picturesque old railway back to life, but for now, 
we leave you with some more memories of its wonderful past.